live everywhere. Daily Kos Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, Kagro in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you doing? It is Tuesday, June 9th, 2020. Time for yet another show. And uh, as always, although we don't always get to, to read it aloud on the uh, in the first minute or two of the show, Bill, chiming in from Portland, Maine, Daily Coast Radio is live now. He lets you know kindly enough. Kgro X, me, David Walden, reports that out of an abundance of caution... President Trump will spend the day in the bunker under his bunker's bunker. <laughs> Why not? There might as well be another one under there. Sadly for everyone, he still gets Wi-Fi down there. I don't know how they work that out. But yes, the president is awake. Our our long national nightmare begins. Uh, I did see some interesting activity early this morning. And uh, let's see, uh, in case you are just becoming aware of the president's uh, having rolled out of bed and grabbed the Twitter machine off the nightstand. Uh, he is uh, now uh, letting everyone know that the protester in Buffalo, the 75-year-old man who was pushed to the ground by police when he approached them, apparently, to return one of their helmets. Though I really don't know why you would bother returning one, uh, and they'll find it soon enough, but you never know. Probably a good idea not to leave it lying around for various reasons. It would probably be photographed by the police and uh, uh, tweeted out to look at the weapons that the Antifa super soldiers have got to fight us with. But uh, he tweets this, Buffalo protesters shoved by police could be an Antifa provocateur. 75-year-old Martin Gugino, Gugino, I don't know how he pronounces it, or even whether that's his name for that matter, I th- I have no reason to suspect that he didn't cut and paste from somewhere. But anyway, was pushed away after appearing to scan police communications in order to black out the equipment. Ooh, very scary. Uh, he gets this news, uh, so-called news, from OANN and cites them. Says, I watched. He fell harder than was pushed. Was aiming scanner. Could be a setup. So, you know, the president's completely crazy. And, of course, today's the day he finally did pivot and become president. Uh, That's where we are now. Lots of interesting commentary about uh, this comment itself, that uh, once again, the Republicans reveal themselves, kill grandma for the stock market, and grandpa's faking his injuries, so, you know, pay no attention, whatever, to the man behind the curtain. Charles Pierce, I think, uh, captures the mood, saying, the helpful healer has logged on, everybody, uh, lots of good comments being made. Noah Schachtman commenting, if your uncle sent this to you on Facebook, you'd check with your aunt to make sure he was okay. Uh, wow. It's really pretty amazing that he keeps digging. And of course, here he is trying to court the 65 plus voting crowd, his, his uh, most reliable voting cohort out there. And he just can't stop crapping on senior citizens. And uh, this one's not going to go over all that well. I don't know. Not sure how to approach it. Uh, and I don't, I'm not ready to, uh, take on the, the critique, the national critique that will surely follow my call to defund the White House neurologist. I figure he's not doing his job anyway and probably might as well realize some cost savings there. The, the great debate to which no one is paying any attention and will stop paying attention, I think, uh, after this comment. Uh, the great debate over whether or not it's okay for some randos on Twitter to tweet the word defund with respect to the police. By the way, um, I, maybe the, maybe defund was a new term to someone somewhere, maybe to some of you. I don't think so. But uh, yes, uh, it is said that, uh, oh my gosh, it's a gift to Trump and they'll exploit it. And of course, it doesn't really matter. They'll exploit it. And really, if you if you said increase funding for the police. They would still say that the leftists say defund the police. So it won't make a great deal of difference whether you correct it now or not. And uh, it really never made a difference whether anybody said it originally or not. But defund the blank is actually a very conservative approach to everything. But never mind, the conservatives don't remember what it was like to really be conservative. They may never actually have been conservative at the time. Uh, you know, we can't play the uh, analysis game and wonder about when that changed for them. Just 
I mean, you can try and put a finger on it, but but it really doesn't matter. They they are not the same people. They claimed to be at one earlier point. They may never have been those people. But defunding things, it comes from defund the left, which was one of their favorite uh, refrains. It just it, it made no sense to people then, and defund the police will make no sense to people now. And that wor- that worried about having it hung on anybody as a slogan. Uh, <clears throat> those who worry that uh, Joe Biden, for instance, cannot afford to be associated with a slogan like defund the left or defund, well, certainly not that one, but defund the police. Uh, gee, don't worry. He's already said, yeah, that's not what I'm interested in. Except that what he's interested in is pretty much the same thing that, as it was explained yesterday anyway, according to one interpretation of what does defund the police mean, he wants the same thing. Even Scott Walker uh, out there thinking he's making fun of it and scoring points off of the idea uh, is tweeting, hmm, reform the police or defund the police? I pick reform. What do you pick? And he's got a poll attached to it, which is meaningless and stupid. But there it is. Uh, he asks in his poll, which one will you choose, reform the police or defund the police? And as uh, has been pointed out this morning, it is interesting that the Overton window has got Scott Walker tweeting, reform the police. So how's that for your slogan? Uh, it's the worst slogan in the world. It'll never get anything done. Plus, it's a gift to Republicans and to Trump. And then Republicans spend the morning tweeting, I favor Reform the police, which is what you thought the slogan ought to be. And now Republicans are saying your slogan. So I don't know what to make of that. I guess it was either a huge victory or you're a Republican. So which one are you more comfortable with? I guess if it's been a problem for you to watch other people say defund the police, but you say something different. And so do all the candidates. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I don't think it's a huge problem. I get the hand wringing, but only in the sense that hey, you guys, you're always hand-wringing, you could stop or, you know, you could campaign right past it. Like I said, uh, maybe that doesn't make any difference either. People wrung their hands all the way through the 2018 campaign and the Democratic Party won the House elections, won control of the House, and your hands hurt. So I don't know what to tell you. you. You tell me what your conclusion is from that. All right. I also note Greg Dworkin tweeting about this uh, this morning as well and uh, took a couple different cracks at it. Uh, Two very interesting pieces uh, to fit into that puzzle, noting first uh, that, um, well, there's a lot of this going on. Noting first the tweet uh, from Hunter Cullen. Who is Hunter Cullen? Hunter Cullen is, uh, I don't know, uh, O-S-I-N-T by day, weather forecasting by night. That doesn't clear anything up for me. But anyway, uh, Hunter Cullen tweeting about a, uh, well, a story that has cropped up. And I think I saw some coverage out there about it, perhaps in Politico they mentioned it. All right. Uh, Nadler, Jerry Nadler, chair of the Judiciary Committee in the House, has warned Barr, that's our attorney general, in a statement that if he doesn't show up to his testimony scheduled, I guess, for today, is that right, at 10 a.m., he will cut off the DOJ's funding by $50 million, which is, of course, defunding the Department of Justice. And that's what Greg points out, that it's a defund Bill Barr idea. Um, eh. We'll discuss what underlies it, perhaps, uh, at some point as well. But it's a good point. De- or is he saying defund Bill Barr. And uh, Greg's second point, even more important, I think, in this one, this is uh, written, is that is that is Hunter Col- uh, Cullen the elite reporter that we're talking about here? Or is the uh, is he the Politico's reporter who wrote this story? I don't even know. I haven't still haven't found the Politico story. I see other people referring to it, but not linking. But Greg says this is by an elite reporter thinking that this idea of uh, withholding $50 million from the Department of Justice to punish Attorney General Barr, uh, that this idea makes Nadler look strong and it'll win over the center right in America. But of course, it's basically defund the Department of Justice. Not entirely, but then it's not a good slogan because you have to explain yourself. Yeah, sometimes you have to explain yourself in the world. That's kind of the way politics goes. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But yes, 
This too, a defunding idea. And then Greg, uh, at some later point, tweets, uh, white elite reporters are having so much fun investing in the defund the police stories and how it will play into Trump's hands when the public is completely into something else altogether. Yes, we're in a gigantic recession, for instance, or <clears throat> still caught in the middle of a global pandemic about which the uh, White House intends to do nothing more. They've declared victory. And have walked on. Yeah, I think the public's mind is on something else altogether. Or even if their mind is on the same question as the defund reform issue, uh, probably on a different aspect of it. Like police still continue to beat the crap out of people for no reason. And the president thinks that they're Antifa super soldiers with scanner equipment secretly shutting down the police. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, uh, he goes on to say uh, the, the elite Reporters doing this really have learned nothing over the last three years. What they think is savvy is actually lazy. Eh, I think well put. All right, let's see. Maybe I'll just run down the Twitter feed of the last, uh, I don't know, three weeks or so. There's so many stories happening and so many good, I think, interesting takes being shared by people out there on it. Uh, let's see. Some of the others. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, oh, by the way. This, this one here reminds me of a story we should catch up on. I just happened to see someone's witty tweet go by. Uh, Mark Glick tweeting uh, uh, tweets as anxiety machine, in case you're looking to talk to somebody who's maybe even more anxious than you. The anxiety machine says, if all lives matter, as so those, some of those folks are, are apt to say, uh, if all lives matter, why won't you wear a mask at the grocery store? It's a good question. Brings us around to the mask issue. Uh, something I meant to mention more about, I guess, or I thought we, maybe we brought it up. I can't remember whether we did it during the break. Greg and I talked about it or whether we brought it up afterwards. The uh, story of the two uh, hairstylists in Missouri who had returned to work while symptomatic, but... Uh, who <clears throat> were wearing masks as they worked and had required, or rather, I guess the, the shop they worked at, required patrons to be masked while they were getting their hair cut as well. And it appears masks may work pretty well, although maybe we just don't know enough. But as it turns out, they ran some tests. There were something in the neighborhood of 100 plus people who had been exposed to these two hairstylists who were COVID-19 positive while they were working, one of whom was exhibiting some sort of mild symptoms. Uh, and they were able to, you know, they're able to trace who those people were and contact them and let them know that they should isolate, self-isolate for two weeks. Testing was made available to them. But apparently, uh, I had heard that 40-something of them, 41, 42, 45, had had... Uh, taken up the invitation, I guess, to get tested and that those test results were back and there were no positives among them, which is fantastic news for mask wearing, I think, as a preventative. But I was wondering, well, what happened to the other 60, 70, whatever number of them there were? And were we just waiting on their test results? Was the testing not mandatory? And it apparently it turns out that the testing was, was not mandatory and uh, most of them declined to take the test, which is not a great outcome by itself, but there it stands. Um, we're like three weeks into the story, I think, and no positives have turned up connected with that. Uh, I would love to have ironclad proof, but we can take it for what it is. Uh, these masks appear to be doing something. If you show up to work as a hairstylist, symptomatic and positive with COVID-19, but put on a cloth mask and your patrons put on cloth masks and sit in the chair with you for a minimum, I would guess, of half an hour for, uh, you know, all right, certainly on average anyway, if not longer. I suppose a few buzz cuts might take less time. But for the most part, you're stuck in that chair for long enough to get infected by that close kind of contact that, uh, that you'll have between hairstylist and patron. And for zero people so far, anyway, uh, plus the you know the, the three weeks, even people who didn't want to get tested would either show symptoms and give up and say, well, I either need to get tested or treated or something, or need to talk to somebody about what happened. 
the fact that nothing has showed up is either one of the more effective conspiracies to cover up a wild raging outbreak of COVID-19 in Missouri, or it is what it appears to be, and masks work. And why won't you wear one in the grocery store? We just showed you that they worked. It's very annoying that it won't really sink in with the anti-mask crowd that way. But uh, I guess for 11 of the million people who insisted that we were all sheep and being fooled into some sort of mind control experiment by wearing masks, maybe those guys will say, ah, all right, perhaps then uh, I will uh, give some thought to uh, not coughing on people for one reason or another is I have just sort of a habit of mine and maybe I'll cut it out. I, I wish that that would sink in with people, but it, it's still pretty obscure as a story, but I, I like to cling to that one. I don't know. And here I am trying to make concessions to the people who are insisting that the whole thing is overblown and we can reopen. Okay. Well, if we all wear masks, it appears that we can. I don't think the outcome is the same if the uh, hairstylist is not masked in that. Anyway, all right. Other news tidbits that we might uh, want to stop and take a look at. Um, well, I saw somebody tweeting the other day. I wonder if I can come, uh, if I can scroll all the way back and find a thing. But I, I noticed, and it would it would require some uh, re wording in order to uh, reproduce the sentiment in its entirety. But I did see somebody pointing out as uh, as we continue to debate over the effectiveness of either slogans like defund the police or tactics like continued protest and uh, the various approaches people can take to protest from uh, very uh, serene uh, candlelight vigils and marches to these more confrontational but yet still peaceful protests against police in which there's, uh, I don't know, I, I, I'm not familiar with the uh, tactics and strategy and organizing of street protest um, in, in terms of uh, what's the motivation behind <clears throat> some of the tactics displayed. And sometimes I, I am just not sure, but very frequently when you see people um, depart from a, a crowd and then approach the police line alone and, you know, ostensibly peacefully, I don't think the police necessarily buy it as peaceful. I just think they misinterpret it. But, uh, but, but I, I assume since we see it so frequently that there's some sort of, understanding among protest organizers as to what the goal of this is. But when people approach and essentially give themselves up to being uh, abused by the police on film, which I gather is a good propaganda tool, but a painful one to be, have to gather. Um, sometimes I just don't understand exactly what they think is going to come of one by one or two by two uh, approaching the police line, provoking uh, a response from the police by being too peaceful and uh, too juicy a target, I guess, and then getting gassed, clubbed, shot with pepper balls, what have you, dragged behind police lines. I assume that's just, again, uh, a, like a propaganda tool, essentially, and, and, and with no judgment attached to the the word propaganda and just the idea is for other people to see it and see police misbehaving and abusing people for no apparent reason. And it, it works, but, uh, well, it's not for me. It's not my favorite tactic. I don't love going out and getting gassed and clubbed over the head, but, uh, braver people than me, I guess, are, are busying themselves with it. But anyway, um, I, I, uh, I was surprised to see, uh, among the, uh, well, I, what I haven't seen more of, I guess I was surprised to not see more of it, but in the, I guess what we would call the epicenter of the protests, the uprising, and I think you can call it that, that's fair enough, um, in Minneapolis, where things really got superheated because, of course, that was the site of the the killing that set this all off. The uh, precinct houses, it was a third precinct it, for the, uh, the Minneapolis police was actually 
burned down. I don't know whether they burned the thing to the ground, but it was set on fire anyway. And uh, it, interesting, two interesting outcomes from that. One was a tweet of somebody, you know, of course, that, that, that gets a, a, a strong reaction. Uh, and of course, which way it swings depends on where you stand on all of this. But the, the, it was an interesting point that this person made, said, you know, the people that burned down the precinct and were out in the streets and, you know, taking the punishment in Minneapolis, despite our hand-wringing over the wording of the debate, in Minneapolis, a majority of the city council there has signed on to a proposal to, in fact, defund the police and to reorganize the police. Um and uh, reassign policing functions to other agencies and uh, back off of militarizing and underwriting the budget of militarizing their police force. So as I was saying, you know, this is sort of a, the, the people who took direct action here and really confronted the police and gave it to them hard appear to have gotten a response that they wanted, whereas... The people who have instead engaged in, um, I don't know, I don't know whether he was criticizing the protesters who have engaged in, again, without too much judgment attached to it, the propaganda filmmaking of uh, either appearing to try to reach out to and work with the police or urge them to take a knee in a symbolic nod to the Black Lives Matter uh agenda if there is one i guess you know i don't want to nail it down to any one agenda or another i think it's uh widespread and diverse enough uh a movement in its in its thought and approaches that it would be difficult to try to pin it down certainly a terrible idea for me to try to pin it down but um the direct action folks have kind of gotten what they wanted but no concessions made elsewhere to people who took more conciliatory approaches to their protest and that is a point. Um, I don't know if it's the point I necessarily want anybody to come away with and say that's the universally applicable point for everybody. One size does not fit all. But I will point out that once again, and you all know this and you were complaining about it uh, yourselves, I'm sure, that a few weeks ago, the, well, mostly white people who were screaming in the faces of police and could not get the police to even bat an eye at any of that, uh, were doing so while well, carrying, in many cases, AR-15s, and they got to go home at the end of their protest. They even won their haircuts, in most cases. And, uh, you know, uh, elsewhere, I guess, not so much. So, you know, score points for direct action. As shocking as it is, one city is actually taking the demand for uh, for starting over with its police very seriously, and they've got a majority among their elected representatives to do it. And it's the one where the precinct house burned down. Now, interesting twist on that. A, or an arrest has been made for this arson. And you'll never guess what color the guy is. Uh, you might not. I mean, maybe you'd be confused about these things. Because very often when you're talking about arrests being made, you are talking about people of color. But not this time, unless, of course, the color is white. Uh, yes, a St. Paul man arrested for burning down the Minneapolis police precinct. He didn't have to come as far as the white boys from Eau Claire did in order to uh, loot the liquor store. But uh, not from Minnesota proper uh, or uh, Minneapolis proper. Uh, and in fact, the story here from KIMT3, I don't know whose affiliate that is. I can't tell. For, is it an ABC looking logo? All right. Uh, St. Paul man arrested for burning down of Minneapolis police precinct, Dateline St. Paul. That's where the arrest was made. A federal charge has been filed against the St. Paul man for the burning down of the third police precinct in Minneapolis. United States Attorney Erica H. McDonald says... Brandon Michael Wolf with an E on the end. He's 23, and he's also accused of aiding and abetting arson. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, he's not charged with the arson, though, so it's not entirely clear who set the fire or, you know, exactly why, I guess. But uh, interesting that the first arrest made 
is Brandon here. Check out the big brain on Brandon. He is scheduled to make his initial appearance in U.S. District Court on Tuesday. That's today. So if you want to hang out and get a photo and prove that he's indeed a, a white kind of guy, you can do it. But, you know, maybe we shouldn't assume too much. The third precinct was overrun during protests on May 28th and heavily damaged due to vandalism and arson, with investigators identifying multiple fires being started in the building. And he just aided and abetted at least one of them, I guess. On June 3rd, St. Paul police officers were called to a home improvement store in St. Paul about an individual, later identified as Wolf, wearing body armor and a law enforcement duty belt and carrying a baton. And this person was trying to get into the store. Interesting. He needed to improve a home very quickly. Or maybe he said, uh, I better go back and rebuild and repaint the third precinct. I don't know what he was trying to do. Store employees said Wolf had been working as a security guard at the store, but was fired earlier that day over social media posts about stealing items from the third precinct. Well, that's a good way to get caught. Police arrested Wolf and say they found him wearing multiple items stolen from the third precinct, including that body armor the police issue duty belt with handcuffs, an earphone piece, baton, and a knife. Officers say Wolf's name was handwritten in duct tape on the back of the body armor. He did that himself, I suppose, unless he found a cop named Wolf and happened to steal his body armor. How convenient. Don't burn this. It has my name on it. And, uh, wow. Well, I mean, at that point, he might as well have had a duct tape that said, I'm guilty of aiding and abetting arson at the 3rd Precinct on the back of his body armor. Uh, all right. Law enforcement says it recovered items belonging to the Minneapolis Police Department, including a riot helmet. Don't try to return it. They'll knock you out. 9mm pistol magazine. Maybe that should have been at the top of the list. Police radio and police issue overdose kit from Wolf's apartment. Well, that's just handy, and they should be handing those things out to everyone anyway. You can't really fault him for taking that. He's just a civic-minded kind of guy. Anyway, we'll be right back, whether with this story or something more interesting. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for K-Grow in the Morning, and I've learned that I either need to update these announcements more often or stop saying that the announcements are brand new. What's not new is that this message, too, is a call for your support in keeping the K-Grow in the Morning show on the air. My thanks go out to all of you who do support the show through your donations. The stats say that Kegro in the Morning fans download our program about 2,000 times each weekday. But our donors make up only about 8% of our daily listeners. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple to make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. If we're helping keep you sane during the Trump era, consider what that's worth. A dollar a day? Fifty cents. One thin dime. We do about 20 shows a month, so pick a number, do the math, and head to patreon.com slash kgrox to let us know. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. All right, welcome back now to the Cake Grow in the Morning Show here on Ned Roots Radio. We'll uh, just sum up here with the end of the story. I was just kind of curious about uh, what gets you accused of aiding and abetting arson versus arson. And I guess the answer is not enough videotape of you actually lighting matches or, uh, or, or Mazel Tov cocktails, as the case may be. But it says here, according to the criminal complaint, Wolf admitted to the police that he was inside the third precinct the night of the arson. Of course, they had the video to prove it. Uh, he took property from the building. And he also admitted, this is interesting, that he pushed a wooden barrel into the fire. Uh, that's a very archaic kind of a, a thing to picture, like a wooden barrel. What would there even be a wooden barrel? Where do you find wooden barrels? Like garden centers, <laughs> I find wooden barrels cut in half to make planters out of them. Uh, whiskey distilleries, uh, you know, where else? I'm not really sure. I, I, de decorative items at Cracker Barrel, but the need for a wooden barrel at the third precinct, I don't know what they're doing there in Minneapolis. I, maybe it's a rain barrel and it's an old time country store kind of a thing. I got no idea, but he did do that. It burned the wooden barrel. So he found the wooden barrel, pushed it into the fire. Investigators say Wolf also identified himself 
in multiple witness photographs capturing him in front of the third precinct, holding a police baton, probably the one he stole, the, with smoke and flames visible in the background. Wolf reportedly admitted to knowing that pushing the wooden barrel into the fire would keep the flames burning. Ah, well, at least he's aware. Wood is, in fact, uh, flammable, except for the fact that <clears throat> I once learned that uh, actually flammable, uh, the real definition of flammable and inflammable are the exact opposites of what you would think they are for some reason. But uh, whatever. He knew that wooden barrels would burn and he couldn't believe his luck. Look, uh, what do they use it for? Duck, dunking for... I was going to say, maybe they're, they've been bobbing for apples in this barrel or something like that. Or maybe, oh, that's it. It's the barrel in which the apples are spoiled. When a bad apple is in there, it spoils the whole bunch. And it's a barrel of apples. And I don't know. I'm not certain why they have it at all. It could have been uh, mock drowning suspects in it. I, I really have no idea. And why he was so angry about that barrel, I will never know. Anyway, there you go. That's how you get yourself indicted for aiding and abetting arson at a police precinct these days, pushing barrels into fire. They're right. He appears to be guilty. It just seems a little strange, and I thought it was going to be more of a high-tech situation here. They're all worried about Mazel Tov cocktails being thrown, and this guy's pushing barrels into fires. Okay. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, speaking of interesting videotape, the Washington Post has gotten a lot of uh, plaudits for a video presentation it has put together, uh, more or less locking down the case that the White House and police officials were totally lying about what they did in Lafayette Square Park. Uh, the crackdown before Trump's photo op, how law enforcement cleared protesters outside the White House is the title of the, I don't know what you call it, video piece, uh, but it's narrated and uh, written up nicely uh, and does a great job in documenting, one, that uh, authorities are lying when they say they didn't use tear gas there. You can see what's being used. And, uh, of course, uh, Attorney General Barr spent part of yesterday denying that it really was what they said it was. And I don't know whether he continued to deny that whether it was tear gas. Uh, he also denied that uh, chemical agents of any kind were used and when confronted with, well, you did say that there wasn't, I think at one point they tried to weasel in, uh, well, it wasn't tear gas, it was pepper, you know, gas. Uh, I, I forget the, uh, the, the the scientific naming that they use for the pepper agent there, but uh, saying, well, that's not a chemical, that's natural, it's from peppers, you see. And of course, lots of chemicals are natural, it didn't really make any sense, and you'd think, you'd hope that the Attorney General is better educated than that, but then again, I can't remember the name, what is it, like Kapiskin, or, I can't, you know, if I'm not educated enough to remember uh, the scientific name for the, the hot stuff in peppers that hurts your eyes that they use for these sprays, but... Uh, he didn't do a very good job. He also, by the way, gave away the store, as it turns out, on the bunker. Um, he was, in part of his interview, he said, uh, let me see if I can't dig this one up. Here it is. This is uh, John Harwood, uh, White House correspondent for CNN, tweeting this observation out. I guess it's taken from a Fox News interview with Barr, in which he's uh, defending the actions of the White House. Uh, but he goes on to uh, say, at least in this clip, that, that they've isolated this bit, that the president, well, they had to do what they did. They had to gas everybody and use the pepper spray and bludgeon people over the head in order to get them out of the park area because the White House was in danger. And in fact, things were so bad, and here's the quote from Barr, things were so bad, the Secret Service recommended that the president go down to the bunker. Which is the kind of, that's the story we thought we were seeing on the night that he actually did it. Ha! It's amazing, but he's really so scared that he had to go down to the bunker. And I don't know whether the Secret Service really believed that there were going to be fence hoppers charging into the White House from this protest, but sometimes they overreact to things. And, of course, their job is to keep the president safe, even if he's not the president. And uh, 
uh, you know, I'm sure that they worried about things, although whether or not it was necessary to really go to the bunker, I have no idea. I've yet to find out, of course, who's responsible for turning the lights out. That's another interesting question. That may also have, uh, also may turn out to be the, um, uh, the Secret Service's recommendation rather than his own. I don't know. But uh, it directly, of course, contradicts, not surprisingly, but directly contradicts the very stupid excuse that Trump tried to give for the reports that he was down in the bunker. Why he didn't just deny that he was in the bunker, I have no idea. But he decided to go with, well, I only was, I went to the bunker to inspect the bunker. And then, only then for a very, very short time, which another person was pointing out, he just kept emphasizing. I was only there for a very, very short time. Really, just, just a quick, I just very, very short time, very short time, this inspection. Which somebody else pointed out, you know, if you're going to go through the trouble of having a panic room style bunker underneath the White House to keep the president safe in the, in the case of an extreme emergency, even though this wasn't one, uh, and you're going to inspect it. That's just what you want. A cursory five second inspection of the thing, right? I'll just look at it and then uh, we'll say, oh, that's fine. Everything's going to be fine. You know, if it's there and it's a serious thing and it deserves an inspection, inspect the thing. Don't tell me I just went down there and I turned around in seconds because I didn't even want to inspect it because I wanted to show everybody how unafraid I was of in not inspecting this thing. I don't know what I don't know what he hoped to gain, but it's it's over now. Bill Barr says the reason he was in the bunker was the Secret Service was afraid for his safety and down he went and I suppose he could have ordered them not to take him there but instead he decided on an impromptu inspection and only half asked at that so there you go that's how brave and efficient a president I am yes I went to the bunker but it was only to half ass an inspection of this important place hooray Anyway, uh, I, I do recommend that you take a look at this video documentary of the crackdown in Lafayette Square Park, and it's very detailed and pretty much establishes that there's no dodging responsibility for it from for the White House, uh, certainly not for the police forces involved, and uh, still a lot of questions about that, and still unanswered, I think. We may have to dig around to see if we can come up with an answer to this one in the uh, minutes of the Arlington uh, City or uh, uh, our county council uh, debates over the deployment of their police department to the scene. But we're still waiting to find out just how Arlington County Police got there in the first place because, you know, the first explanation was, well, they were there in support of the mutual aid agreement between the district and the surrounding jurisdictions. And then found out that the city was saying we never invoked the mutual aid agreement, so there would be no reason for Arlington to be there. And Arlington authorities saying we didn't authorize the dispatchment of Arlington police there. And I, did Arlington police just decide to go? I don't know. Love to find out what was the story on that one. Let's see. Uh, we'll roll on here. Uh, what is this? Oh, yes, right. You remember yesterday... We had mentioned that uh, Seattle, Greg had mentioned Seattle City Council had banned their police department from using tear gas, at least on a temporary base. Apparently, as it turns out, uh, it was the mayor who had issued a 30 day ban on the use of tear gas. I don't know, to settle down and see whether it's really enough fun to use again later or something. I'm sure there was a better excuse for that. Um, and then I said, well, it doesn't look like there was a ban on tear gas because the video that I'm, I was seeing yesterday on Twitter um, of the confrontations in Seattle appear to evidence quite a bit of something like tear gas being used. Well, as it turns out, I learned this from Joshua Holland's tweeting yesterday after cops ignored the mayor's 30-day ban on tear gas. I guess the mayor's clout doesn't run that far in the police department, uh, which, by the way, we hope uh, teaches the mayor a lesson in terms of uh, well, if the mayor's got to get out there and deny that uh, defunding the police department is a good idea and we don't even want to use that word and how dare you and we're distancing ourselves from it. 
It doesn't appear to buy you anything with the police department. You very clearly banned the use of tear gas, and they said, who's the mayor? We don't even care. There's no civilian control of our our warlord gang here. We can do whatever we want. Well, anyway, and another iteration of the story. As a result, what does is, what is the rest of Seattle's leadership have to say about this? Well, the Seattle City Council, having seen the cops ignore the mayor's ban, is now talking about defunding their police department by 50% and reinvesting those dollars elsewhere, which is a long way of saying defund the police. But uh, I guess that's also supposed to be a sop to people who are like, well, oh, don't say that. Oh, 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 oh reinvest. Oh, okay. Yeah, that I'm okay with. So, all right. Everybody's happy on this one. Why can't police follow the law? I just don't know. But it wasn't the law. It was just a 30-day ban. Okay. I thought that was pretty interesting, too. So a little bit of an update on that one. Um, effects on fallout from the protests in the corporate community beyond uh, tweeting statements uh, for the Black Lives Matter movement or even making corporate donations to the NAACP and other organizations uh, fighting this battle. Uh, substantive change, it looks like, just this according to The Verge uh, publication, uh, about which I can tell you next to nothing, except that I've seen the name around and long enough uh, to know that it appears to uh, have been around as a legit source of, we may even have gone to them a couple times in the past, uh, just don't know the background fully. But anyway, here's the news. This is what we wanted to talk about, not The Verge. IBM will no longer offer, develop, or research facial recognition technology. IBM's CEO says we should reevaluate selling the technology to law enforcement. Jay Peters reports for The Verge. That's very interesting. You'd think that that was a, a very lucrative contract, and the idea that they might give that up uh, because they don't want to be, at least because they don't want to be associated with what will eventually be uh, or may already be, the misuse of this technology by police departments. IBM will no longer offer general purpose facial recognition or analysis software. IBM CEO Arvind Krishna said in a letter to Congress today. Uh, what's today in terms of, uh, let's say this was a, this is yesterday's article. So yesterday in the letter, we found this out. The company will no longer develop or research the technology. IBM tells The Verge, Krishna addressed the letters to Senators Cory Booker of New Jersey, of course, and Kamala Harris of California, of course, and Representatives Karen Bass, also of California, Hakeem Jeffries of New York, and the aforementioned Jerry Nadler, again of New York. IBM firmly opposes and will not condone uses of any facial recognition technology, including facial recognition technology offered by other vendors for mass surveillance, racial profiling, violations of basic human rights and freedoms, or any purpose which is not consistent with our values and principles of trust and transparency, which I guess is an internal IBM document title. Krishna said all of this in this letter. We believe the time to begin, the time, we believe now is the time to begin a national dialogue on whether and how facial recognition technology should be employed by domestic law enforcement agencies. A much larger question and an interesting one. I probably don't get into it in the letter or the article, but it's a good idea. Facial recognition software, of course, has improved greatly over the last decade thanks to advances in artificial intelligence. At the same time, the technology, because it is often provided by private companies with little regulation or federal oversight, has been shown to suffer from bias along lines of age, race, and ethnicity, which can make the tools unreliable for law enforcement and security and ripe for potential civil rights abuses. I might clarify that uh, paragraph a little bit. I would say uh, the technology has that, I thought that was a little awkward to say that it has this bias because it is often provided by private companies with little regulation or federal oversight. Uh, it has that bias because that bias exists in the companies because that bias exists in the people who comprise the company. Um, but I get the point that uh, if things are working 
correctly and you have a functioning government that actually, you know, oversees its own activities uh, correctly and applies the law correctly, uh, the government would presumably, in reviewing the software and finding the bias that exists because it was created by humans, uh, but finding that bias, they might say, yes, this is an inappropriate tool for us to use because the bias is evident in the software will create bias in the policing and we can't have that that's supposed to be against our values and and we don't want it and and in fact can't have it uh but we might be able to get around it by saying well we the government didn't create the software we just bought the software and while the federal government may be precluded from incorporating that kind of bias into its police work, private companies, I guess, can, by law, anyway, uh, it's not protected activity, but it's not pros proscribed activity, discriminate or evidence that bias, especially if it's uh, either an accident or just an undiscovered flaw in either the software or the thinking of your programmers, for that matter. Um, but private companies can't be held to account in the same way that the government can. Um, and you might be able to sue them for agreeing to use it regardless of the known bias. But uh, apparently, I guess, uh, some people had planned to push that fault off onto the private companies developing the software. I, we just use it. Eh, you know, it's a tactic that's worked before, not quite like that. But very often, uh, you know, in many instances... Uh, the government will get a hold of evidence that it could not have produced by itself uh, because it would have been inadmissible evidence violative of various constitutional rights. But if someone else, a third party, produces the evidence and turns it over to police, as long as police weren't using their investigative powers to discover it themselves directly, sometimes it becomes admissible. Anyway, um there's a lot at play in in that paragraph, and I don't know that I would necessarily say that the technology, because it's developed by private companies, uh, has this bias. I, I think it's also worth pointing out that had it been developed by the federal government, it would also have that bias. It would become perhaps maybe a bigger problem for the government to continue developing it once that becomes obvious. Um, but it's nice for them to point out here I guess the, the point you can suss out of this is that a functioning government would say it really doesn't matter where the bias lies as between public and private development. If it's got the bias, we shouldn't use it. But uh, they never came to that conclusion. They were happy to use it. Now IBM has come to that conclusion, and I guess we should be happy for that. In 2018, research by Joy Bo hmm, Bolamini. Bolam Wini, wow, and Timnit Jebru, G-E-B-R-U, I'm not going to spell the other names here, revealed for the first time the extent to which many commercial facial recognition systems, including IBM's, were biased. This work and the pair's subsequent studies led to mainstream criticism of these algorithms and ongoing attempts to rectify bias. Everyone wants to try and rectify bias. On December a December 2019 National Institute of Standards and Technology study found empirical evidence for the existence of a wide range of accuracy across demographic differences in the majority of the current face recognition algorithms that were evaluated, for example. The technology has also come under fire for its role in privacy violations, notably NIST's study, National Institute of what is it, uh, uh, Science and Technology, yes, Standards and Technology, uh, the NIST study did not include technology from Amazon, which is one of the few major tech companies to sell facial recognition software to law enforcement. Oh, everyone should uh, be aware of that. Yet recognition with a K, recognition, right? The name of the program has also been criticized for its accuracy. Interesting. Uh, oh, probably its lack of accuracy, I would suppose. In 2018, the American Civil Liberties Union found that recognition incorrectly matched 28 members of Congress to faces picked from 25,000 public mugshots, for example. Well, that'll, that'll straighten things out for you. <clears throat> uh, 
Another company about which I have an article still stuck in pocket somewhere, Clearview AI, artificial intelligence. Clearview AI has come under heavy scrutiny starting earlier this year when it was discovered that its facial recognition tool, built with more than 3 billion images compiled in part from scraping social media sites, so I guess I'd be in there, was being widely used by private sector companies and law enforcement agencies. See, again, you know, oh, we didn't develop it, we just found it. Clearview has since been issued numerous cease and desist orders and is at the center of a number of privacy lawsuits. Facebook was also ordered in January to pay $550 million to settle class action lawsuits over its unlawful use of facial recognition technology. IBM has tried to help with the issue of bias in facial recognition, releasing a public data set in 2018 designed to help reduce bias as a part of the training data for facial recognition models. But IBM was also found to be sharing a separate training data set of nearly 1 million photos in January of 2019 taken from Flickr without the consent of the subjects, though the photos were shared under a Creative Commons license. I guess that'll tell you about the strength of that license. IBM told The Verge in a statement at the time that the data set would only be accessed by verified researchers and only included images that were publicly available. The company also said that individuals can opt out of the data set, though no one knows how, I'm sure. In his letter, Krishna also advocated for police reform or even defunding, who knows, arguing that more police misconduct cases should be put under the purview of federal courts and that Congress should make changes to qualified immunity doctrine, the qualified immunity doctrine, among other measures. In addition, Krishna said that we need to create more open and equitable pathways for all Americans to acquire marketable skills and training. That's a bit off the subject, but related. And he suggested Congress consider scaling the P-TECH school model nationally and expanding eligibility for Pell Grants. So he shoehorned a couple other interesting issues in there under the wire. But interesting to note about the facial recognition technology, to be sure. Let's see, what other fun things have we put aside here? <clears throat> ah, let's uh, switch subjects for the few minutes before the 10 o'clock break. Back over to that global pandemic with some new news. And this is what I, uh, uh, if, you're, if you're listening in the background, this is the other item I meant to bring up yesterday but forgot about on my way to getting to the story. <clears throat> This is uh, new timeline news on the coronavirus. A new Arizona-led study, University of Arizona, study shows coronavirus began to spread in the U.S. Ready? Later than previously thought. This uh, requires some interesting rethinking of the timelines and who did what and was responsible for what and when. Uh, Henry Breen writes this piece for, uh, I found it on Tucson.com. I'm not sure which paper it was was responsible for it, but the infected patient, they begin, who touched off the first major coronavirus outbreak in the United States probably arrived from China after President Trump restricted travel from that country, according to a new study led by a University of Arizona researcher. Genetic analysis of the virus from hundreds of patients showed that the first known cases of COVID-19 in the U.S. and Europe were successfully kept from spreading in January. And it was new introductions of the virus weeks later that led to sustained transmission networks in Italy and Washington State. This is a new version of the story. We've kind of changed the narrative of the beginning of the outbreak in both North America and Europe, said lead author Michael Warabey, Uh, W-O-R-O-B-E-Y, head of the university's Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. The findings suggest public health officials had even more time to implement aggressive measures to stop the virus than previously thought. Our analyses reveal an extended period of missed opportunity when intensive testing and contact tracing, like the South Koreans, could have prevented the virus from becoming established in the U.S. and Europe. The researchers wrote, on January 31st, the Trump administration barred entry to the U.S. by foreign nationals who had recently visited China. It was very porous, poorly done, etc. But since then, the president has claimed that his travel ban prevented a much worse outcome from the virus. 
But the new study suggests COVID-19 actually took hold here roughly two weeks after the restrictions were imposed, most likely during the period when an estimated 40,000 U.S. residents were repatriated from China with screening described as cursory or lax. Warabay authored the study with fellow researchers from the University of Arizona, the University of California, San Diego, UCLA, the National Institutes of Health, and universities in Canada, Belgium, and the UK. Their findings have not been peer-reviewed just yet or published in a journal. The manuscript was released online late last month through that unpronounceable uh, website, Bio RX IV or RX4. I remember we've we've hit on this before, uh, but this is the preprint server that allows researchers to make their findings immediately available to the scientific community. Such rapid release of information could be crucial as scientists race to understand the virus and contain the worst global health crisis since the 1918 influenza pandemic. Using genome sequencing and thousands of computer simulated epidemics, Warabi and company identified mutations in the virus and tracked its likely movement among places and populations. What they found is that the earliest widespread outbreak in the U.S. was probably triggered by an infected patient who arrived in Washington State from China sometime around February 13th, almost a month later than previously thought. In other words, the man originally believed to be patient zero for the U.S., a Chinese national who traveled from uh, Wuhan to Seattle on January 15th, was actually a dead end. The study shows he recovered from COVID-19 in isolation without spreading it, thanks to an exemplary effort by medical personnel, local health authorities, and the patient himself. Well done, everyone. Something similar appears to have played out in Europe, where a woman from China unwittingly infected one of her colleagues in Germany during a January 20th business trip to Munich. That first case was later blamed for the eventual outbreak in Italy, but Warbury, uh, Warbury Bay and company now believe German health officials successfully contained that. Instead, the Italian epidemic was lar lar likely rather triggered by a different traveler from China in early to mid-February. And according to this new study, the virus then made its way from Italy to New York City sometime around February 20th, triggering the largest transmission cluster there. Very interesting, backwards from what we originally thought. Welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Edwards Radio. I guess we should wade further into this story just to see what there is to take away from it. So uh, backwards timeline from what we originally thought. Uh, and I guess also, uh, well, you know, he'll never acknowledge it, but the science appears uh, once it's reviewed, maybe we'll be sure about that or more sure about it. But uh, it appears to say that once again, the one thing that Trump has been able to point to ineffectively to date to prove that he really was, in fact, aggressive in responding to the coronavirus was the crackdown on travel from China. And we knew already that it was porous and poorly executed and that, you know, 40,000 people managed to come back from China uh, under the loophole he left. And I, he may have been politically forced to leave that loophole. I don't know how you uh, say, yeah, American citizens aren't allowed to come back to the United States to escape this virus, but then you're supposed to screen them and isolate them ahead of time before releasing them back into the general population. And we didn't do anything like that. 40,000 people is a lot of people to have to, to uh, isolate, but you know, that's how you contain a virus. And we didn't do that. And it was very stupid. And in addition, it wasn't even just American citizens either. If you were a Chinese national, if you landed in Canada first and then came to the United States, they let you through without asking any further questions. So, uh, clarifying when and how COVID-19 has spread should help health authorities evaluate their response to it and develop new ways to address future pandemics. One clear lesson seems to be to get aggressive right away. And that was the big problem for this president. He just didn't want to do anything. The precise impact of the slow rollout of diagnostic tests in the U.S., when there were tests available from the World Health Organization, as we know, on, in the early stages of the pandemic, is likely to be explored and debated for years to come. Even though there's really no debate, we should not have done that. And that's it. 
the value of detecting cases early before they have bloomed into an outbreak cannot be overstated in a pandemic situation. Even now, Warabi said, the U.S. lags far behind other countries in the use of tests, contact tracing, and isolation to slow the spread of COVID-19, which is why we're not really doing very well with it. And we now have 2 million cases. The apparent success of such early interventions in Washington State and Germany should serve as both a rallying cry and a reason for hope. He said, this virus is not invincible. We, we've got some tools at our disposal that do work against it. We only have to put them to use. And that's, I guess, the part that we've been lacking in. So an interesting addition to our knowledge. If it holds up, uh, you know, lately we've seen a lot of uh, uh, fascinating results in research in the coronavirus area uh, fall apart upon further inspection, but that's the scientific process and uh, you have to be uh, worth uh, or are willing to uh, to take those items with a grain of salt before they are peer reviewed and uh, react properly if they are later withdrawn. I understand the latest on the hydroxychloroquine situation is that the study uh, cited almost immediately on pre-publication um, uh, appearing to indicate that it actually worsened outcomes is now in question and uh, may even have been withdrawn at this point. Although uh, there's still pretty good evidence that hydroxychloroquine is of no help in uh, preventing anyone from contracting coronavirus. Uh, it's not clear that it absolutely does lead to worse outcomes when used to treat patients who have already contracted it, though there's also no evidence that it actually helps just yet either. So uh, not as dire a situation for hydroxychloroquine as once imagined, and maybe shipping all of that, uh, all those materials that we, that would be really interesting. Uh, having shipped all of the uh, materials on which we wasted money, thinking it would be a prophylactic and shipped them all to Central and South America, because that's what we do with crap that doesn't work or that we don't need anymore, whether it be uh, malaria drugs or Super Bowl T-shirts from the, the wrong team. That appears to be our, our solution to everything. And maybe they lucked out. And as long as they're not hoping that it will be uh, a helpful prophylactic, maybe somebody gets better from all that. And that would be terrific. And, of course, uh, leave it to the United States to have blown it on that twice. All right. Uh, speaking of coronavirus spread stories, we had the good news of the masks work stories, and now we have the bad news of other poor practices do not help anything. Small scale story here, and we hope it keeps, stays small scale, but uh, in case you were waiting for the, hey, what about all those people at the beaches story to break out, uh, again, it's not entirely clear that it is particularly dangerous to be outdoors and on the beach in that in nice, lovely, windy situation there. Maybe helps, maybe not. I don't know. But there are some things that kind of go hand in hand with the visit to the beach that we shouldn't forget about. Pennsylvania County, CNN reports, traces at least 12 coronavirus cases to Jersey Shore party goer, because that's what else goes on when you go down to the shore. <clears throat> or as we say in New Jersey, go down the shore, which isn't all that ridiculous given how often we pause to note that the English say that you are going in hospital. Uh, Ganesh Seti reporting this for CNN. A dozen new coronavirus cases in Bucks County, Pennsylvania have been traced back to a single New Jersey resident who spread the virus at beach house gatherings on the Jersey shore over the past two weeks according to a county health department news release. <clears throat> he had to come back inside of a house in order to transmit it successfully, apparently. And that's worth noting. This is exactly why we can't let our guard down now, even if it feels safe to be at the beach. County Health Department Director Dr. David Damsker said in the release, one unlucky exposure can lead to a large-scale cascade of cases down the line. We want everyone to enjoy the warmer weather and have fun, but let's keep in mind that COVID is still circulating in the community at baseline levels. 
There will likely be additional infections among family members of the new cases, <clears throat> added Damsker. The 12 individuals are currently isolating at home and are experiencing mild symptoms. County spokesman Larry King, believe it or not, told CNN. That's the, uh, the longest conversation CNN has had with Larry King in some time. <clears throat> it is unclear whether all 12 had attended the same gatherings as the New Jersey resident, and then why trace it to him? I'm not really sure. The New Jersey Department of Health is also investigating the exposures which occurred over Memorial Day weekend. At a house gathering in Cape May County, the department said in a statement to CNN, the attendees were, well, who do you think? College age students, the department said, adding that though there may be additional cases identified, it's now the outer limit of the incubation period. We are gathering information to understand who was the initial source of exposure that caused the outbreak, said New Jersey state epidemiologist Dr. Tina Tan in the statement. Bucks County reported 33 new COVID-19 cases on Saturday, 11 of whom were traced to the New Jersey resident. Health officials also traced an additional case that had been reported Friday. All of New Jersey's beaches had reopened in time for Memorial Day weekend, though with capacity limitations and social distancing requirements. Masks were recommended but not required. Governor Phil Murphy's office could not be immediately reached for comment by CNN. Nearly 5,000 residents have tested positive for the virus so far in Bucks County, according to the health department. The county is one of 33 in the yellow phase. They're using colors there, I guess, of the state's reopening plan. The phase allows gatherings under 25 people, outdoor dining, and in-person retail. Statewide, there were 701 new COVID-19 cases and 45 deaths reported Saturday, according to a statement from the Pennsylvania Department of Health. There have been 75,086 confirmed cases and 5,931 virus-related deaths in total as of Saturday. New Jersey, meanwhile, reported 864 new cases and 79 new deaths on Friday, bringing the state total to at least 163,336 cases and 12,049 deaths, and I think it's actually even more than that. So, you know, got to still be careful. And uh, the young and vulnerables are the ones who decided uh, to do this. And, and guess what? They brought the virus back with them, and now we'll find out whether there are any of the older vulnerables that they uh, might have visited might also have been exposed. Interesting, the yellow phase. I imagine they're, are they going with uh, uh, green, yellow, red, or probably in reverse, like red is uh, no going out and yellow phase is like phase one everywhere else. I hope it's that. And I hope it's not like yellow and brown phase. <laughs> like, oh, oh God, oh crap, we really screwed this up. Go to brown phase. Everybody goes back indoors for this one. Ah, I don't know. It's Pennsylvania. They could be doing anything. All right, let's see. Uh, other items, uh, let's up for bids, as they say. And it looks like, Twitter may have changed their formatting formula such that uh, the tweets I've put in pocket in the last couple of days have gone back to the, the more readable format. That's good news. Whereas the older ones are still kind of out of whack. But uh, let's see. Uh, will this bring us somewhere? I don't know. Let's see. I, I have this. Uh, we'll jump around a little bit. I have a... Twitter thread recommended to me by Patrick Snyder, who frequently suggests some very interesting threads. This one from Kanosur, whose uh, threads I believe we've read in the past. Uh, this is an interesting place to start. Does this cross us back over here between our subjects? To put this in context, and what in context? I don't know. Let's take a look at the thread. It doesn't have anything else. Ah, to put this in context, one of his own tweets. Um... This is the context, or the thing that needs context. Uh, the other original tweet, staggering, he says, connoisseur does, how much is spent, quote, protecting VIPs? This is, I guess, from out of the Secret Service annual budget of $2.23 billion a year. Did you know the Secret Service spent so much money? Well, of course, pointing out that that could buy health care coverage for so many lower income families. But it's an interesting thing to take a look at how much money we spend on Secret Service. And it's I mean, they do more than just protect the president. 
that's true. So I don't know if the full budget is $2.23 billion a year or if that's just the protection budget. But that's an awful lot to spend on protection. He goes on to say, put to put that in context, the Secret Service budget is, the, uh, the amount is the same as 50% of Belgium's entire military budget. Belgium's not a huge country. Population, as he notes here, is $12 million. Belgium, though, has universal health care, although that's enclosed in scare quotes because it's funded by mandatory health insurance. So they have some sort of... Uh, mandate individual mandate i guess college tuition though in belgium costs 400 to 1500 dollars a year depending on income and the availability of grants an interesting comparison as well so a downside he then says of having 400 million guns in circulation in the u.s is that we have to th th did you know there was a downside here's one of them we have to spend billions of dollars each year on state security apparatus like the Secret Service to provide security just to VIPs when other developed nations prioritize funding health care and education. Instead, not as much of an assassination threat to your president, I guess, if you don't have 400 million guns in circulation. That's a, that's a good point. Aside from the $2.3 billion budget for Secret Service each year, cities across the U.S. spend $100 billion each year or $772 per person in Baltimore, for instance, on policing, plus, of course, the $85 billion spent on incarceration. And he notes here that in New York, it's $5.6 billion. L.A. spends $4.8 billion. Chicago spends $1.6 billion. Policing budgets, this goes to the defund reform uh put in a paper bag and shake in breadcrumbs, whatever you're going to do to the police debate. Policing budgets don't reflect money spent on police misconduct settlements either. That's interesting. Good point. New York Police Department has spent $40 million so far this year to settle misconduct claims. Chicago Police spent $100 million in 2018 to settle lawsuits. LAPD has spent $880 million since 2005. Uh... The point being bolstered here by a screen grab from theappeal.org, uh, which he helpfully provides. Uh, so you can see the direct correlation here. You see where the numbers are coming from. Uh, the fifth tweet in our thread here, police departments across the U.S. have spent billions of dollars just to settle police misconduct claims. Could fewer guns reduce both crime and reduce the cost of policing? Reduce aggressive policing and reduce the cost of police misconduct settlements as a result. It's, it's definitely entirely possible. Uh, how you get there is another question, but a good point. Could fewer guns in circulation lead to smaller police departments, smaller policing and incarceration budgets? U.S. Uh, now spends $185 billion on policing and locking up people each year, saving the country potentially trillions by 2040, that could, of course, be used for health care and education. It's an interesting point and worth thinking about. Uh, if you are uh, unconvinced uh, somehow by the necessity of some sort of police reform, you can certainly incentivize it. And maybe even uh, traditional conservatives might even be incentivized to consider this if it meant alleviating budget crises in other important functions elsewhere in every budget, except that, you know, your traditional uh, conservatives that don't believe that those items should be in the budget anyway, uh, education or mental health or health care, etc. But uh, a good thought for practical progressives to entertain. So I appreciate having that thread at our disposal. Uh, another interesting piece here that we ought to uh, uh, perhaps add to our collection this is an interesting thought, and uh, you, you, it's hard to see how this couldn't be the case, and you probably inherently knew it, but it's good to see it pointed out uh, clearly on its own. A New York Times piece here by Lara Jakes and Edward Wong, who write under the headline of U.S. diplomats struggle to defend democracy abroad amid crisis at home. Police violence and President Trump's threat to use the military against protesters 
not only are stupid and horrible and undemocratic, but they have undercut American criticism of autocrats abroad and called into question our country's moral authority. Yes, uh, eventually it would have to. Let's get a taste at least of how this article explains it. American diplomats who are the global face of the United States are struggling with how to demand human rights, democracy, and rule of law abroad amid concerns overseas and criticism at home over the Trump administration's strong-arm response to the protests across the country. Diplomats are being confronted by the unrest arising from the death of a black man in police custody in Minneapolis, in case you didn't know what this was all about somehow, assaults by security forces on protesters and journalists nationwide, and a tear gas attack that the Trump administration officials ordered this past week on peaceful protesters outside the White House. The world definitely saw that, of course. It was covered live by journalists from all over the world who were themselves pushed, shoved, punched in the face, and tear gassed as well, including most famously, I think, the Australian uh, news team right outside the White House that everybody saw on video clips being circulated on Twitter getting uh, pushed around by riot cops' shields and, and just the cameraman who's busy shooting and can't see what's going on punched in the face. It was a real disgrace. In private conversations and social media posts, career diplomats at the State Department and the United States Agency for International Development have expressed outrage after the killing of George Floyd and President Trump's push to send the military to quell demonstrations. Diplomats say that the violence has undercut their criticisms of foreign autocrats and called into question the moral authority of the United States, uh, or the moral authority that we try to project as it we promote democracy and demand civil liberties and freedoms across the world. Remember the ones they hate us for, right? It has also handed adversarial governments, including those of China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea, a powerful propaganda tool to paint a dark portrait of the United States. And I guess we only make it easier for them. The article, of course, goes on at quite some length after that, but I think you get the idea of it. And uh, I do recommend it for reading all the way through, of course, uh, see if there's some other ideas you can tease out of it. But uh, the, the big deal, of course, is, yes, this is also doing us incredible damage internationally. And I have no doubt that that didn't occur even for a second to Trump. Uh, if there was any thought given to the international image of the United States, you'll recall from the reports of his discussion with Putin that night that uh, it was Trump's belief that the rest of the world would see this as tough, strong, and resolute, not as an abdication of American values right here in the middle of America. But okay, you know, he's not very smart. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, once again, I guess merging two of our current favorite subject areas, the protests and coronavirus. I did see an interesting uh, treatment of the subject. It's a, a little late in bringing it out to the show, but for those of you who have been thinking about uh, the possibility of another spike in infections and whether or not the protests have a role in that. Some interesting ways of thinking about it. One of the more uh, thoughtful uh, I saw shared here online by uh, Akela Johnson, a blue checkmark type person working at ProPublica, as it turns out, and uh, writing this uh, analysis of it. Uh, There's been a lot on Twitter about how protests could spread coronavirus, I recently talked to black protesters in D.C. They know about the coronavirus, of course, and they especially know it's killing black Americans at double the rate of others. But it's a part of why they're out there, as you may have guessed by now or may even have had it established directly for you. But this was a, one of the uh, earlier um, complete thoughts and analyses of this. So uh, this is from June 6th. That's only a couple of days ago. George Floyd, she continues, was killed by a white police officer who kneeled on his neck for eight minutes, 46 seconds. Graphic video of his death circulated online. Floyd's death, the flame, the pandemic, kindling. Folks said enough is enough. I want to highlight what some have told me. Uh, also interesting subtext there. Uh, yeah, a lot of people have speculated that the pandemic 
has kindled the flames uh, both by keeping people cooped up, but also by adding so many other stressors to life. Um, but this is a, a more direct line here uh, that has to do with the unequal effects and why they're happening as between uh, various ethnic communities, let's say. All of it comes together. What happened with George Floyd publicized to the world the experience that we live. It's a conglomeration of everything. Uh, a quote from Timothy Freeman, a pastor at Trinity African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. Awfully long name of the church there, but I got through it. Uh, another quote shared here. We internalized a lot with my generation. Carolyn Jackson, 62, said, but I think it's important for him to see this. Who's him? It's her 21-year-old grandson, Caleb Jordan, who said showing up meant passing on the spirit of, passing on the spirit of resistance in the face of injustice to the next generation. Another quote here, seeing the life leave Floyd's body was the finally the last straw that broke the camel's back for me, said William Smith, 27, but he also thought about the people he knew, a handful of them who died after catching the new coronavirus. Here's what he said about them. They were living in impoverished areas, couldn't get proper treatment, lived in crowded conditions, social distancing was hard to do, and they were still forced to go to work and be put in harm's way. When speaking out against the loss of black lives, protesters told me it is tough to separate those who die at the hands of police from those who die in a pandemic that has laid bare the structural racism baked into the American health system. And she's put together a full story on the subject, also worth reading, but uh, these being the highlights, I thought we could get more juice squeezed from the story this way than reading through it uh, uh, in full. But uh, the story is here. It's linked. You should take a look at it uh, under the title of On the Minds of Black Lives Matter Protesters, a Racist Health System. Uh, a few more tweets in the thread here, at least one more that we want to share. To be clear, a major reason black communities bear the brunt of the pandemic is because of longstanding health disparities. Societal barriers have compounded for generations to put them at risk, linking to yet another uh, ProPublica piece about this early data shows American African Americans have contracted and died of coronavirus at an alarming rate. I think we already we knew about that, but uh, another full accounting of it in ProPublica by Akila Johnson. Anyway, that I thought was uh, worth noting, and uh, worth noting that yes, they are giving thought to the fact that it could create further spread of the coronavirus. But the fact that it's run rampant in the black community is part and parcel of what leads to their need to protest. Also, I guess on a slightly, I guess we could say a slightly less um, uh, intellectual take, but still very much a valid take and uh, one worth sharing. Let's see. I saw the and maybe she maybe in private or public life. Uh, Danny Fernandez is considerably more uh, considerably deeper than even this observation would suggest. I don't know. But Danny Fernandez herself, a blue check type individual uh, lists. Uh, you know, I know I never know any of the celebrities who they are. TV writer, actress, Disney character and author in The Good Immigrant, about which I am also unfamiliar, but, or with which. Anyway, I thought this was, this is a more streetwise, I think, uh, expression of some of the same feelings. All week, she says, conservatives have been retweeting protest images like, I guess social distancing is done. Look, and by the way, they were never particularly good with social distancing, but I guess they were, they were supposed to be owning us by saying, you were the ones who said you wanted social distancing. Now you're protesting. What's the story? Well, she says, look, if I do end up getting COVID, it'll be from changing legislation and getting these cops charged, not because I wanted to drink at Dave and Buster's. And I think that lays down the bottom line pretty nicely there. Uh, I get it. You get it. Now, apparently she also got a response 
that is a very common one. And I thought she had a good response to the response. Someone responded, she says, like, I wanted to see my mom before she died. I, uh, look, and she's pausing here and says, if you see this tweet and lump your mom's passing in with the haircut crew, I can't help you, but maybe take a minute to see how it looks that you're the one lumping the two on the same page. And I think that, too, is a good point. We're a little bit late on our break music, so we'll cut out at an unusual place just to keep uh, the timing right here. We'll take our last break and head into our last segment. Uh, A lot of uh, good responses to her thread contained therein. You should take a look at them. Uh, Quick points here. Killing Granny to increase the Dow a few points and get a haircut was okay, but trying to make the country better for millions of Americans, a bridge too far. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the K Grow in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Joan McCarter is with us, uh, and uh, I was going to say a little shaken up, but uh, I guess that's, uh, you know, I'm not kidding. It's not a joke. Apparently, uh, we're breaking news. I don't know if anyone else has reported this anywhere yet, but earthquake in Idaho, eh? Yeah. Is it centered in Idaho? Do you know? Yeah, it was just a jolt. We yeah, had okay. one on March 31st that was quite big. It was a 6.5. Oh. About, what was it, 90-some miles north of Boise. Huh. I wasn't and we've had literally hundreds huh. of shocks and tremors and quakes since then. Well. So another that... one about half an hour ago that's just enough. I've got a a problem with vertigo huh. <laughs> that I've not been able to, to resolve. Well, okay. <laughs> and certain things can make me dizzy. Standing in an elevator bay. Where there are oh. elevators on both sides hmm. makes me dizzy. Okay. Escalators make me dizzy, and earthquakes make me dizzy. <laughs> well, that's easy to, I guess, to understand, right? It shakes you up like that. I didn't even realize that uh, that, that was an earthquake-prone region. Is it? I mean, or is that new? Yeah, so, very geologically okay. active right. here. Okay, that makes some sense. Because, like, Oklahoma never was, but then they... Drilled they out all there. Yeah. yeah, no, we, we've we've, okay. you know, we're not California, but we have faults and and occasionally get all... a pretty big jolt like this one. Huh. Okay. Well, the one uh, that happened back in March. This one was small, but yeah, just enough to be annoying. I, I and they they're all a little alarming. I think we almost you know we don't have anything serious around here, but then there was that really you have weird... hurricanes. Yeah, we do have that. It comes from above. The problems, <laughs> the, the problems below, we don't expect. We did have that one once that shocked everybody. It was mild by comparison to where they really have quakes, but where you're not used to having earthquakes and you have one. But, but uh, all right. Well, uh, I'm glad everything is okay. Weird. It's yeah. a strange sensation. It, I can you know? believe it. Yeah. And uh, elevators uh, and escalators can do that to a lot of people. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's a distinct problem for me, although there are some escalators in the Washington, D.C. metro that are so huge and long that I think this is so long. It yes. disorients a lot of people going up and down those things. And I've, I've definitely lost my balance just standing there looking at things and your vision shifts and say, what, what direction am I going? This is crazy. <laughs> I'm not even moving. So I can understand that feeling. Uh, and it's a easy time to lose your bearings in general without earthquakes. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. It's kind of, kind of odd out yeah. here in the world yes uh i would say so what uh what makes you say that joan <laughs> why not segue into something you know 
fun and interesting. What, but uh, what's on your radar these days? It could be anything, of course. But uh, well, there's there's glimmers of good news. Yeah. Oh, where's we that? We had thousands of people show up for a candlelight vigil in Boise mm. for George Floyd. Yes. Organized okay. by and a handful earthquake. of teenagers. Great. The, the, I tell you, they're the ones organizing all these in a lot of the small towns uh, around the country and that have, it's made a huge impact. So great news for all of and us And you're seeing it in tiny towns all yeah. over, certainly even in the West, where, so, yes, you also have some people believing the busloads of Antifa are <laughs> yes. on their way. Look out for them, please. <laughs> um, and you do have people showing up with their semi-automatics, but... Mm -hmm. But thus far, nobody's been killed. Yes. And, you know, uh, well, that's because that. no one shows up to shoot at, I guess. Although by the Antifa. Yes, right. Or uh, by the the defenders of the people against the Antifa. So, you know. Yeah, right. I, I was noticing that uh, the buses of Antifa never show up, but the cars plowing into crowds of protesters keep showing up all over the place. Yeah. That seems weird. Uh as it turns out, we had one here in 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 Virginia, in which the uh, and I'm always fascinated when people get identified this way. Is the leader of the of the clan in Virginia? Apparently, that's a clear enough uh, hierarchy that they're able to point to that. Can't can't identify anybody in Antifa, and they have no buses. But these guys have ranks and keep driving their cars and trucks into people. But we're worried about the fake buses. Weird. Weird. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's nice that the, there was, uh, uh, activity again. And I love the fact that it, so many of them turn out to have been organized by the local teenagers. And I, I start to wonder whether they, whether their parents are telling them, no, you can't go to the big city for the protest. So they say, well, we're going to be active right here or whether they we'll just say yeah. they have the sense innately that, uh, no local action is always best. We'll find I'm out. not sure that enough of them were wearing masks, which is a bit uh, of a concern, well, but yeah, uh, which I, yeah. I ended up deciding not to go watching all of the mm -hmm. people walking by my house on their way to it. It was several blocks away at the Capitol. I see. Um, <clears throat> and not seeing a lot of masks. So since I abide with an 81 year old person. Yes. Or a boat with. <laughs> yes. It seems safer uh, not, right not to do it. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, that's a calculation everybody has to <clears throat> has to make. Um, yeah, I, I, in fact, I have a COVID test scheduled today, not because I suspect that I've got it, but because I need to uh, submit to a medical procedure that now requires this, apparently. If you're going to go into any of the hospital facilities, they say you got to have a current COVID negative in order to, to get in the door. That so, makes sense. Yeah. This is my first uh, test on this. So after the show, they're going to go check and see if they can reach my brain with a, one of the How swabs. That, yeah. One of the swabs that didn't get thrown out from the visit to Maine by the president, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> yeah. Everywhere you go, wreaking havoc. Right. Contaminating I'm glad everything. that you're doing it. I'm glad that they are doing it. I'm glad that they are not following... WHO's maybe recommendation, maybe mm -hmm. advice yeah. that asymptomatic people can't. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> that their was, latest. That was very confusing, and that was a big mistake. We've yeah. already had confusion from WHO and from the CDC on whether or not people should be wearing masks. Right. And now they're making it even more confusing by talking about asymptomatic versus pre-symptomatic versus mm. who knows what. So. Yeah. Well, a lot of people will be frustrated by that one. Trump will, of course, say, see, I told you WHO was terrible, and that's why I defunded them. And then, and oh, gosh, the defunding. Problem. Yes. Wait a minute. I thought defunding was an evil Antifa plot, uh, but uh, I guess only as applied to the police. Defunding everything else, your education, your health care, all of that defunding, that's the good kind of defunding that middle America loves. The other kind is the scary type. Please don't say the word. I've been a little astonished at the hand wringing over that, but okay. Um, it's it's a it's a difficult concept yeah. for people to defund the police is a handy bumper sticker phrase. Right. Don't make a bumper sticker, but 
Yeah. It's, it, it would it's, fit. We understand you that. Know, it's, it's, you have to have something that can fit on a cardboard sign. Yes. And, a piece uh, of cardboard that, that you can carry around easily. Right. right and true. it doesn't get into the layers of what activists, civil rights activists, advocates are actually talking about, which is why are the police dealing with homelessness, with mental illness, with social problems in schools, why do we have cops in schools? Right. Well, you can say it's because we have rampant gun use, mm-hmm. <laughs> often ending up True. in schools, but that's not what a lot of the resource officers there in schools actually end up responding to. All right. True. It's, you know, disciplining kids. Yeah. And, and, and really, we need cops for that? And doing the same poor job they do with disciplining protesters very often too winning themselves there's as many videos of yeah of 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 them manhandling beating and using overwhelming force on on kids in school uh but i don't know those haven't been shared as much in the last couple of days it's a totally different context but in explaining what what uh, defunding might mean and why you would want to do it that would be useful to remind everybody about i think because, you know, you could use these funds that are going into police departments to actually beef up social services to help people who are homeless, to help people who are mentally ill yeah. and on the streets. Not throwing them in jail, not having cops deal with them, but actually giving them assistance that will prevent them from doing yeah. anything that has to involve the yeah. cops. Freeing so, up the cops to do the things that you think we can't defund them because they spend their time on, they could actually spend their time on. When they spend huge amounts of their <clears throat> their time on dealing with things that aren't endangering life or property. Yeah. I'm sure they find that frustrating and annoying and a waste of their time, too. So maybe that's it. That would only fit on the bumper sticker, you know. Assist the police by lightening their burden. Oh, that doesn't really ring either, but okay. That doesn't really ring either. And and when they hear defund, when yeah. they hear we're going to lose some money, yeah. out, deal, out, out of their brains goes the any idea of, oh, this will make my life easier. Right. Less yes. I'll have to deal with. Um, it's going to be a long battle, but, you know, it can happen. I just saw this morning the Senate in Colorado, Hmm, even with Republicans, have passed a sweeping police accountability bill. Okay. Unanimously. All the Republicans on board. Well, I guess uh, it must be having some kind of impact between that and Scott Walker saying, yeah, we should reform the police. Not really it, it's it's in, going but... to require all officers to use body cameras, uh-huh. ban the use of chokeholds, um, limit when they are allowed to shoot a person who is running away. Ha, yes, okay. Which <laughs> that'd be good. It would be nice if they like, could yeah. ban Mostly that kind of. Yeah, but um, limit. Okay. Um, <laughs> Don't miss. That's, that you know, I have to have to justify why they are pulling somebody over. Yes. And stopping them and making them show all their documents. Right. Um, and require mm. other officers to intervene when they see fellow officers using yeah. excessive force. I mean, so, yeah, you know, okay. these are not all at all controversial kinds of ideas. We're supposed to be doing that now. Yes. Okay. That's how you get, I guess, uh, uh, unanimous consent for it. Oh, yeah, we should definitely, you should have to have a reason to pull over, uh, pull people over, and you should tell them what it is. Uh, That's because cops lose cases on that, on not doing that all the time because it's required. Should we require them to do this required thing? Oh, yeah. You bet. Okay, good. Yeah, none of this should be controversial. It certainly wasn't for Republicans in the Colorado Senate. Yeah. We're in the just, U.S. Senate, yeah, <laughs> there we might have a problem. Uh, even the, the Republican senator who was uh, viciously attacked for no reason by his neighbor, standing in the way of a bill that would prevent other people or criminalize it when uh, uh, other people viciously attack their neighbors for no reason. I'm not certain why he's not sympathetic I, to that. Just as an aside, I don't think there was probably no reason. Uh, 
Well, that's probably true. You're right. Yeah. I, I misstate the case. However, he's not here to tell us what the reason was. I have a few guesses, but I don't want to, you know, speak for him. You're welcome to call us and tell us why you decided to pummel Rand Paul. I, we will listen. <laughs> the lines are open. But yes, you're right. Good observation. Thank you. I didn't want to wander too far uh, away from reality on that one. Good catch. <laughs> It, it seems very unlikely that Mitch McConnell's going to take this one up. Yeah. This one being the legislation introduced yesterday by Karen Bass, Jerry Nadler in the House, and ah, Kamala yes. Harris and Cory Booker in the Senate. Okay. To great fanfare from, and, and, you know, advisedly so. It was important that somebody in official D.C. stand up and say, hey, we're paying attention. Hmm. We want to fix this. Yes, uh, it's it's a bill sort of like the Denver bill or the uh, Colorado bill. It's it's not extensive reform. It's not defunding the police. It's not rethinking how we do law enforcement in the country. It's saying here are things you can and cannot do. We've said these are here are the things you cannot do. And now we're going to make the law stronger so that you really cannot mm -hmm. not do these things. Yeah, uh, well, that's I mean. That's helpful. I mean, one of our big problems is, has been in the past in legislating, and particularly in areas like this, where it seems so obvious that this should be illegal and, and it's made illegal, or sometimes we even federalize the crime, and then we fail to say what we're going to do when those prohibitions are ignored, because we can't believe anybody would ignore them. They're so sensible, and they're federal Basically. law. Yeah. So we do run into that quite a bit. Um, so it's it's not hmm. a particularly far-reaching or ambitious bill. It's an important bill. It is saying, okay, here are things that we see happening that we've said before need to stop. So, hey, really, let's stop them. Hmm. It's not defending the police. Yeah. It's not creating the kind of systemic reforms that, that I think the discussion now is going to be centered on. Um, but still important stuff that Mitch McConnell will totally ignore. Yeah. Well, that's his job is to, because he's also, things. you know, he, he, his job is to not talk about the things that makes his president unhappy. Right. Like yeah. the fact that we still have coronavirus raging. Uh, yes. That we are officially in a recession, which started the national economic bureau. What, what's any -E EBR? What does that stand for? Any, yeah, uh, I don't know. National what? N -E anyway, the people who say <laughs> who say when we have recessions ah. have said we have a recession. Okay, that's it's that, official. It started in February. Yeah, which is before right. all of the COVID restrictions and before the everything shut down. So right. the virus um, told us we had a recession, and we just didn't listen yet. So. N B E R. In National the, Bureau, Bureau of Economic, Economic Research. Okay. I'll take it. Well, okay. The official recession guys. The official recession guys say as of February, we're in a recession. Thank you, Mr. Trump. Hmm. For the past 40 years, every recession has begun under a Republican president. Yeah, that's, I guess that's true. I always... Uh, and for a while, they were all just Bushes, as it turns out. <laughs> but now we have more Republicans to choose from that, that do this to us. Uh, I was always surprised about that. But all right. Yeah. Well, uh, not only that, but uh, I, I guess in, is it the case that uh, it always feels like the case that it's always the, the Democrats that follow them that lead us into recovery? <laughs> I mean, Funny I guess, how that works, yeah. that have to go in and clean up the mess and then start the recovery again. And they right. do it without raising taxes, which is kind of a problem. But Yeah, well, uh, that's because they're programmed that way. Uh, maybe things will change at some point. We've done a pretty good job in shifting the conversation. And now that we're in the middle of uh, a conversation about... Um, uh, Reprioritizing Where our budgets money should be spent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. But once again, the cleanup job falls to us, and it's intentional. And lots of people have pointed out the way the cycle works is that uh, you know Republicans uh, 
cut things that uh, you know undermine the the foundations of the economy in the name of giving rich people tax cuts, knowing that it will create a gigantic deficit and that will hobble the efforts of the successor Democrat to do the things that are actually a part of the affirmative Democratic agenda because they have to instead triage the failure of the previous Republican agenda. And and I think they like it that way. I think they do like it that yeah. way. And it's hard at this point to see it happening again, to think that they're not doing it deliberately. Yeah. Well, uh, we, we may have to make that case again anyway, just in case anybody misses the point. Oh, we're going to have to make that case again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Starting luckily, it's been written. about January 22nd, 2021. <laughs> yes. Uh, all right. Probably true. So we'll prepare for that one. And uh, we'll see whether this recession lasts us all the way. I, we, there's no real reason to bet on recovery, I guess, given who's in the White House. And uh, There's very little reason yeah. to bet on it because, for one thing, we, we don't have this coronavirus thing under control. No, but they are ignoring yeah. it. It's going to be, when you see the way cases are spiking, Arizona now says it's in an actual medical emergency, has told all of its hospitals to go on emergency protocols mm. because they are that overloaded. And Texas is following suit. Um, 22 or 26 states all have seen a rise in the last two weeks in cases mm. and hospitalizations. <sighs> If only someone had warned the states that they might run out of hospital beds if they weren't careful. I feel like that needed to be said at some point, and yeah. they must have ignored it. And all right, you know, all the and states. And everybody said they got on this New reopening York. bandwagon because everybody else was doing it, and and here we are. And the harm this is going to do to the economy. The how are we going to be able to shut down again now that no. so many places have reopened, even with this level of of reinfection or infection. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, uh, I'm sure my, my guess is it's just not in the cards that the, even when it makes sense scientifically, uh, that's not where the, the elected leadership is uh, particularly among Republicans and they still control half of this stuff. Uh, that's just not where they are. They don't believe in it. And, uh, it, won't, it certainly won't be something they push, even if people, the the, uh, the voters actually would support such a move. And you ask them and they say, yeah, you should absolutely, if it doesn't work, you shut down. That's how it would work. You try this new thing and then if it fails, you go back to what was working. But uh, that doesn't reflect itself in the positions of uh, elected Republican legislators federally or in the states, almost anywhere. So, yeah, we may be in trouble with that one. <laughs> And, slightly, uh, yeah, slightly, and, and you can't. Uh, I mean, I, that, that's when the real impact of the of the pandemic will hit us. I mean, there's so many people who take the success in not overwhelming all of our hospitals and not having you know people dropping dead in the streets as proof that the whole thing was overblown. When really, I mean, I I think the the reason that global pandemic as a global issue is because they say even if it's not a deadly disease if everyone's sick how do you produce anything how do you ship anything how do you sell anything and uh i don't know they somehow ignored that that part of it if, if it wasn't killing you immediately they didn't believe it could have downstream effects because you know republicans in the future <laughs> they don't yeah. believe in it we'll all be the, dead the, the, the future like reality has a liberal bias yeah I mean, that's that's the way this thing works. Over time, this is how the, the, the reaction it will produce. People will be sick and out of work. And, uh, all you know, I guess if you take mistake Twitter or your conversations out in public uh, for reality overall, yeah, it, it, it seems like if it doesn't kill you five minutes after you get it, it's not a real disease. And there's never been anything that works like that. And even among things that you believe are real diseases, but uh, economic impact is just, you, they say it's the most important thing to them, and yet they don't consider the economic impact of, you know, 40% of the workforce unable to report. But 
okay, whatever. Luckily, <laughs> um, not everybody believes the same thing as their, their legislators. And uh, I am reminded, and there's a nice survey out there, that uh, the, the reality is that most people are very cautious and slow about returning to work and returning to retail and dining, despite the fact that all the pictures are of the outliers People right. who can't wait to get out there. So who are defi- defending their right to be out there without a mask on with right. their gun? Um, yep. Yeah, it's kind of a problem. It, it, one that would be relatively solvable if we had, say, adequate testing. Hmm. Yes, that would be a good idea. Uh, um. If if we had procedures to know who who was carrying the virus and needed to stay home and who didn't, mm-hmm. it worked for New Zealand. Yeah, uh, they have zero cases. Oh, zero. Wow. Now that's what Trump meant when soon it would be zero. He meant New he Zealand. He meant New Zealand. Yes, he's a genius, really, in a way. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure why. The business community didn't demand more testing or maybe when they did, it just didn't, it fell on deaf ears and that's all there was to it. But th- that was the way to get things open well, again. Yeah. With and, the rapid you know, testing. They should have, but I, you know, when you're represented by the chamber of commerce, which is saying reopen anyway. Yeah, I guess. And it's telling all of the lawmakers to reopen anyway. Mm. I, yeah, it's like the Chamber of Commerce is the police union of the business community. Like, yes. <laughs> totally unproductive in every way. Uh, even in representing their own members, they make them look bad. So that's weird. Yeah, two things we can do. It is weird. And it's, is it a uniquely American point of view that labor is expendable? Yeah. Disposable? I think uh, maybe it kind of is. Yeah. Although I guess, you know, uh, that does remind me. I mean, it's, it's very, very is very American, although there are certainly other places that believe in it. We just don't pay as much attention to it. But it occurs to me that those places most infamous for treating their workforces as disposable, uh, even though they're tiny places, uh, I've noticed they're also at the top of the uh, infection charts. Uh, Persian Gulf states, these oil rich Persian Gulf states for whom labor is about imported Indonesia and indentured servants essentially have enormous infection rates. Although I I doubt very much that it has infected much of the oil rich elite, the worker populations are the ones I assume who are in trouble here. And, uh, And yeah, there's the answer. I guess look at who in the United States is disproportionately affected. Right. The people who have to go out and do the work of, uh, making sure that the people who you want to reopen their hair salons have enough meat on the table or whatever, right. or collect the garbage when you're done with the meat. So, and it's the black and brown people. Yeah. Well, disproportionately. Right. And that's why that, I guess that's how the, the two issues became so entwined. And uh, again, I guess also something we learned in reading some of these threads about people being very mindful of, the continuing pandemic when they choose to go out and protest and say, yeah, I know it's still out there, but I know better than you that it's out there because we've had it. Yeah. What an am- it is an amazing situation we find ourselves in. And uh, <sighs> it's a bizarre, bizarre time. Yeah. Um, if you want to take something good out of it, sure, take out of it that there are changing attitudes toward Black Lives Matter and toward the police. Yeah. You now see majorities of people, even white people, saying, yeah, this is a problem that has to be fixed. Yes. And even in the NFL saying it. You see things like our new poll from Civics in Iowa. Oh. Did you see that this morning? No. It's very fun. Joni Ernst is trailing in her reelection bid. Excellent. By three points, but still, Teresa Greenfield leads Ernst. And um, Trump and Biden are tied. In Iowa? In so, Iowa. Iowa. Yes, okay, all right. Uh, well, that is good news. I will take it. I didn't see that. I'll, I'll grab that and let everybody see that. You know where to go to find it. But 
uh, I'll point it out. That that is good news. Uh, definitely a great way to end it. Uh, especially well, opening up with an earthquake and disorientation, and then ending with uh, shaking the ground under Journey Ernst. And hope she'll spend the day disoriented instead of you. Thank I you. sure hope so, and I hope yes. somebody makes her answer whether or not she saw Donald Trump's teeth this morning. Oh, yes, well, yeah, the uh, rotating... I have to expect that a lot of Republicans haven't seen with it this morning. <laughs> yeah, uh, or that's the answer, certainly, right? Yes. Uh, well, it doesn't matter whether you saw it or not, say you didn't. <sighs> okay, well, thanks, Joan. I appreciate your uh, getting it together after an earthquake to come in and... and share this with us so uh, thanks for uplifting us at the end there too i appreciate it <laughs> you're welcome great i ha- i am hoping now that there will be more such good news for you to bring to us next week i will purposefully not look at the civics poll so that you can lift us up next tuesday thanks again that's a great idea yeah less for me to do right uh, defund me i guess okay thanks joan we'll check in with you again in a week have a great day uh, stay safe and healthy And uh, all of you should do the same, as a matter of fact, including Justice Putnam, who brings you his perspective. From Daily Coos Radio, on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to The Kegro in the Morning Show. With David Waltman. All right. Justice is up next, and of course he's got his eyes on all of the same stories, plus more. Pompeo and Barr both refusing to answer Congress so far. No subpoenas yet, but refusing to answer Congress. And the Senate Republicans poised to let them get away with it. No surprise there, but more surprises in his selection of stories next.